Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk about geothermal networks. They uh, are in the stage where they have many names and they're all the same thing. We've called them the GeoGrid until a shale subsidiary sent us a cease and desist and trademarked it. Um, we've called them the GeoMicro District until we realized no one could say that. Uh, so for now, geothermal networks. And what I'd like to share with you is how this is a pathway we shouldn't um, ignore to an efficient economic and equitable energy future, which we hope are all trying to get to. I have to move this down. <laughs> God, I, I was having Sorry. issues too. Technical challenge, like the cursor is gone. Yep, it's a slight problem. Oh. Okay, we advanced. I clicked on something. So I tend to do All this right. slide no, uh, almost every time because the word geothermal is so freaking confusing. We have a lot of language problems in this space. So geothermal, <laughs> Um, is kind of like the last name of a family and every single one of the kids is different. Um, so on the, uh, on the left, you see something called a, a geo district. Um, it's what Cornell is putting in where they go down really deep mile and a half and get like hot water and then pipe it around to provide heating. And that's the easiest one for people to understand when they say, oh, district energy. Um, and that is more common in Europe and growing here, particularly on college campuses. Um, the next in there is geopower. Um, that's what a lot of people think about if they think, oh, wait, doesn't geothermal sometimes cause earthquakes? And uh, yeah, they go down miles and sometimes fracture the rock. Sound familiar? Um, but mm -hmm. it is a really cool way to make power if you have the right spot and you do it correctly. So. Uh, but that is going down to basically the heat from the center of the earth. All right, the next two are more what we're talking about. We're not tapping into any heat source in the center of the earth or, or volcanic. Do not think Iceland. <laughs> um, and instead, what we're actually doing is using the stored thermal energy, thermal energy being heat, um, of millennia of sunshine. So the top portion of the earth is at a stable temperature that matches the average temperature of that location over time. So uh, in Massachusetts, we're about 55. I assume you guys aren't far off. Uh, you just go a few feet down and there's this stable temperature. What this technology does is basically uses that to pull with heat pumps, which move heat, um, heat uh, during the winter and cool during the summer. And uh, over the year that balances. Um, and so the one on the right is when you take that technology for an individual building, like if your neighbors said, oh, I got geothermal or a ground source heat pump, that's what they mean, um, and make it accessible to everyone. So um, uh, it is expensive to put in these, these pipes and, and this technology. And it, so even though it's the most efficient form of electrification, it is not accessible because there's a lot of upfront money. And that's a great solution for utility. So I've kind of skipped ahead a little, but I wanted to make sure we were really clear on what kind of geothermal we're talking about, because I've gotten a few steps into a presentation and realized that we weren't. So um, do I just hit the space bar? Uh, the mouse pad. Mouse pad. Ah, it was <laughs> working. Um, a, a quick note on um, the idea of systems change. It means you have to do everything which is very exhausting. Um, so you really wanna to talk to every stakeholder and that's what we do. We don't just talk to um, climate uh, advocates uh, and we talk to scientists, we talk to um, uh, legislators, we talk to people who don't believe in climate change, we talk to the workforce, we talk to utilities, everybody, because that way we understand where all the barriers are and figure out where we have a, a space, sometimes where there's the biggest problem, you have the biggest leverage point to drive some kind of change. And so that process is iterative, it moves around and around, and then you, you, you get some problem and you start throwing pro, uh, questions at it. Um, and that moves at the speed of trust is super important because um, 
every we we believe in relationship based change, and so it, we've got to build relationships even across really unlikely um, contexts. So the first part I want to do now that I've kind of framed it is just quickly go through the challenge we're trying to solve, maybe in a different way than you've heard it before, because I'm pretty much focused on originally the gas system and the and the thermal transition, so heating and cooling for buildings, mostly heating. Um, so this is a map from Massachusetts. I apologize, I have no maps from Rhode Island, but this is a map of all of the gas leaks in, in Boston. And as you know, carbon dioxide is like one blanket on the earth, right? But that leaking gas, the methanes, carbon um, is, is actually 84 times in the first 20 years, which is like putting 84 blankets instead of one. Um, and so this is why we went for it in the beginning, because it was a giant lever that was fast and we need fast and giant. So if we cut a little bit of methane leakage, we can really um, rapidly uh, impact our, emission, our, our greenhouse uh, gas, uh, greenhouse effect. Um, and so uh, in Massachusetts, we went at that by identifying all the gas leaks, mapping them. This is a current map of Massachusetts gas leaks. Um, <laughs> And there's a whole story to that. Um, and we, we, we uh, basically found a way to identify the largest volume leaks and fix those first to cut the methane faster. In the process, we built relationships, which was really the collateral that came out of it, even though we have successfully gotten, um, at this point, documented about 2% of our greenhouse gas footprint in Massachusetts reduced by targeting the largest leaks. So unfortunately, it's not our, our national accounting doesn't actually work, so you can't see it. But um, and just so you know, we're we just finished a, a survey in Washington D.C. and in Philadelphia. Um, this is a old city problem, um, old infrastructure, and very common. Um, but you know, there's another problem because you might look at that old infrastructure and think, oh, okay, well. The way to fix it is to put new pipes in, right? Because these pipes are shit. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and so that's what we did in Massachusetts. We passed a law bef before I even knew about this in 2014 to fix all the old pipes. And um, at this point, that law is going to cost us about $40 billion mm -hmm. of new pipes going in the ground. And um, as we were learning about the gas leaks, we started to understand that those pipes get paid off by us, the customers, over about 40 years. And if you aren't going to be using them because you have a climate law that says you have to get to a certain target by 2050, you, you can't pay off the pipes you're putting in the ground. So they're literally required to put billions of dollars of new pipe in the ground, which we cannot use, and which will basically have to be paid off by a shrinking number of customers, which means a spiking price, right? So here's how that looks. Here's our, our gas grid behind us and a bunch of customers. We're just gonna pretend this is real. And um, well, one neighbor, oops, one neighbor uh, got an air source heat pump, yay. <laughs> and then another one and another one. And this is the approach we have currently in our strategy for electrification where we're gonna, we're gonna go for it wherever we can get them. And yeah, mm -hmm. air source heat pump, awesome. And look, mm -hmm. maybe we've got like a little clusters of neighbors, but now, that gas infrastructure hasn't changed in cost, and the remaining neighbors still have to pay off the same amount, right? That's a really big problem. That's a huge problem. So we must electrify. We've got to get everybody off gas, and yet the process of doing that can't land on the backs of those who haven't yet electrified, right? And you know who? It's not, it's not going to be equitable, right? It's going to be the people who didn't have the money up front to pay for a, their own system. It, and you know the Germans call it the last grandma problem. Um, that there's going to be this one grandma paying for the whole system. It's kind of you know non-real, but gives you the idea. So um, that challenge, we thought, well, okay, we have this money allocated. A, a large amount, $1.7 million per mile of gas pipe on average in downtown Boston, it's $4.4 million per mile. Um, so, wow, that's like money we can electrify with, right? 
can we put an extra seat pump on every house for that? I started running numbers. Um, and then uh, started worrying about this problem um, and started worrying about a bunch of other problems. So this there's a balancing act that has to be played out in our policy as we electrify. Um, on the one hand, we really can't allow the gas system to collapse because there's millions of people relying on it. And you guys in Newport saw what happened and we saw in Merrimack um, Valley, um, we have to have a managed transition. We can't, we can't allow the system to collapse. We can't allow um, it to not be maintained because it's freaking dangerous. And, um, and we have to not allow uh, the cost to spike, right? So that's a lot of um, orchestration. And of course we have to actually um, we have to actually not do what we're doing, which is what every state in the country is. They're continuing to invest in their gas infrastructure despite all of our climate goals. And that is just a disaster. It's a slow moving train wreck. Um, and a lot of people point to RNG and hydrogen. It's, as far as I'm concerned, a pipe dream. Um, there's, there's no way, uh, cost wise, you can eliminate it just in economics um, as a home heating fuel. Not that you couldn't use green hydrogen in industrial applications, just say. Um, so what do we do? Oh, there's one more problem. Sorry, we're going to start with all the problems, right? <laughs> um, so there's one more problem. And this is one that I, I think is really interesting, but it's a little geeky. Um, so if you look at all of our electric use for the whole country from January to January, our peak electric grid use for buildings, sorry, just for buildings, is in the summer when everyone's running their AC, right? And that's what it is um, pretty much everywhere around here too. Uh, and so if we switch all of our heating to electricity, what happens to that? So we, we ran the models um, and uh, we, we named the curve a falcon curve because it looked a little like a falcon. But basically if you did what we're not going to do and switch everyone to electric based board heat, <laughs> which of course we're not going to do. But um, you get this crazy wings of the Falcon go up on the winter peak. So you get, you're basically your electric grid is going to need to be four times or more larger on that winter peak, which is really a problem, right? Because we have to make our electric grid green and, and clean. And building it out multiple times is, is it's going to slow us down. So we moved to an air source heat pump, which is wonderfully, magically more efficient. Um, and these are not direct, like there are air source heat pumps that get better and worse efficiency. I, this is just an efficiency of 100%, 200%, 400%, and 600%. So if we electrify with technology that is more efficient, we spend a dramatically less money on the electric grid and have a better chance of getting to our goals. That's the summary. Um, and the last item is a geo network. Um, so the geo network gives us our, our lowest, uh, our flattest electric grid demand. So we the least need for building out and investing in the electric grid if we switch to home heating with that. Um, so long list of problems means we have a long list of things we want. Uh, so this is a list that came out of all of the conversations with all of the people. Um, if we managed to get something that met every single one of these, we would have removed all the key barriers for each of the each of the players, including the utilities and the workers. Not every barrier, but just the really, really important ones. Um, and so we we started putting this list up and people laughed at us, which was fun. Um, but it's it's a lot of things, safety, emissions, reliability, affordability, and there's so much in each of these. Um, this is really what we need. We need that efficiency because of that winter peak, right? We wanna take care of our electric grid as we electrify. We need resiliency, right? Um, and uh, scalability and adaptability, our climate's changing. We can't build an entire um, heating system and size it all for a climate that is going to rapidly evolve. So, um, and we have to do it all fast. So, so this was our solution. That's massively oversimplified, but um, it was, okay, what's our most efficient way to electrify? Oh, 
it's the ground source heat pump. And so, oh, but the problem is that no one can, they're really high cost up front and you need this infrastructure and also you need land space. So, um, and then we looked, okay, well, district energy is pretty cool. That gets everyone, it does the equity part and it doesn't, it avoids the upfront cost, but it keeps getting powered in the center by fossil fuels, right? Um, or they, I mean, in Sweden, they actually burn trees. Anyway, um, so, so we put the kind of the two ideas together and, and looked at networking the ground source heat pump by putting uh, heat pumps in every building and a very large building would have multiple heat pumps, but say we're just gonna talk about one little home, there's a heat pump. That heat pump is not running off the outdoor air, which changes widely, right? Instead, it's running off the temperature from the ground, which comes in in a supply loop to the house from the street, kind of like your gas line comes into your house, but instead of providing gas, you're providing temperature. And so the heat pump pulls off heating or cooling, which is awesome because we need more cooling, um, and uh, then sends the warmer or hotter water back into the system in the street. In the street, you have a large pipe with a large flow of water that's carrying temperature. And that temperature is gonna be maintained by a managing utility that has put in a whole bunch of geothermal boreholes in the street, maybe in parking lots, a park, um, maybe purchasing uh, thermal energy from other locations. Um, when you start to map out where there's hot that's wasted, there's a lot. So all the data centers and ice rinks are great. And like, there's a bunch of places where you can capture thermal energy. And the more we explore that, it's kind of amazing. Um, so you can do all of that and the utility basically distributes it and the customer just gets the heat pump. And even in some proposals, the utility could purchase the heat pump and have it be part of the infrastructure, which is, there's some pros and cons, but that would actually make it even more accessible to absolutely everybody, right? So um, just to explain the way that we get further than a ground source heat pump, because what we're seeing in, in the data from some installations is that there's a much greater efficiency from these networks. Apparently sharing actually works um, than from an individual heat pump. So that is maybe a supermarket or a nice rink up there and it's cooling. So it's drawing cool from that supply. And then um, it's sending hotter water back, right? So it's sending heat in. And then it, these other buildings happen to be heating. And in this, we're just pretending we're in the winter here. And so at the very same time, they're doing two different things and those um, energy demands are canceled. Um, so we're calling that synchronous load canceling or you could call it waste heat recovery. There's a lot of ways to name everything. Um, but you can do that without any boreholes. And in Sweden, they have a utility building installations that's just doing that. And they're getting 30 or 40% efficiency increases just by sharing energy between buildings. And one thing I never knew was that large office buildings are frequently cooling in the middle of the winter. Um, so add the boreholes and you can start doing asynchronous or not at the same time load canceling because you can take extra heat in the summer and raise the temperature of your of your of your bedrock slightly and then come winter you pull the temperature back out so you're balancing seasonally the temperature and using the bedrock as your thermal battery so thermal batteries are a really good way to store energy they're really cheap and the cheapest biggest battery i know of is the earth um, so we hired Bureau Happold Engineering. So, oh, you know, we walked into the offices of several gas utility presidents in Massachusetts and um, just told them we thought they were going to banter a utility death spiral and have lots of stranded assets and explained why. Um, and we thought, we were kind of thinking we'll probably get to like. <laughs> Um, and then we explained that we really thought that they should prune the tree and, and, and 
and uh, move branches of old infrastructure onto new infrastructure that doesn't use gas, like networked ground source heat pumps, and we explained it to them. Um, interestingly, all of them were interested right from the start. Um, they all plan 30 or 40 years out and understand the situation they're in. Um, so one of them said, when, came back to me and said, well, you know, um, I'm having trouble explaining this to my middle managers. They want to know this, 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 this. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so we hired Bureau Happel to do a feasibility study for, the, for all of the Massachusetts gas system. Um, and what they did is they picked out representative street segments um, that basically represent the Massachusetts gas system in, 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 uh, based on data that the gas company shared with them. Um, and, uh, and then they ran, this comparison is not, can it do it for everything? It's actually, if you only use the right of way, nothing else, and you don't have any waste to capture, and you um, have these loads and a, you cap your boreholes at 500 feet, which you don't have to do. We just put a box around it. Like, okay, if you put in every 20 feet, a 500 foot borehole in the right of way, how much energy can we get? And it turns out we can provide all of the heating and cooling for the low density residential, for the medium density mixed use, a huge amount of it for the um, medium density and a significant part for the downtown. <laughs> um, but the piece that's hidden that's not there is that there's additional potential beyond what is there on, on two of the types of street segments. In fact, it has the capacity to produce more cooling than is needed. And this one has the capacity to produce more heating than is needed. And so if we start to interconnect them, we not only capture that, and then we add in the other thermal energy. So we're, um, Attempting to do, I'm I'm going to skip over this a little, adjust, but um, the uh, that question of what street segment to do, I just stuck this in because a lot of people look at the previous one and think we shouldn't do high density, but actually it's the most balanced. So you actually are going to get the most energy for your dollar in that high density mixed use that has the most mixed use, and that's why. It, in Massachusetts, our first projects going in the ground are in that kind of setting, and they're just adding some boreholes in a field or a park. Um, so the growth model, which is embedded in this, is that you can put in one street segment, take out your old gas pipe, put in a street segment of this, you back your gas system up, um, and then you keep going. You put in another segment, another segment, and uh, continuing to back the gas system up, you keep the um, customer base of both the geo and the gas emerged the same rate base, which allows all of those gas customers to not have spiking prices as you progress. Um, and then you get to a mostly geothermal network. There's going to be other things. You can have air source heat pumps on many of the houses. No, none of our energy systems are every house is the same thing, but you could do this. You're going to have individual air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps. You're going to have some people that are resistant as hell and have a propane tank. You know, it's going to be a smorgasbord, of course, but you can do this. And um, doing it will allow us not just to minimize our impact on the electric grid and provide an equitable transition for low-income customers who rely on utilities to simply provide them their energy. Um, but it'll also, um, it'll also provide uh, energy storage capacity, um, which is another uh, boon. So I promise I'm not gonna go into all of these, but I'm just gonna pick out three benefits that I think are really interesting and in how they're playing out now. One is, that affordability. So we've had three different economic projections done. And in all three of them, the um, network geothermal bills will be lower than gas now and going forward, increasingly lower. Um, that's really good. Uh, in this projection, that top um, spiking, that is the energy burden for the low income um, for uh, a 
uh, house by house electrification where the gas system is just um, losing customers. And then the bottom one is a transition that uses the network geothermal um, to, to move with a merged rate base. Um, so another really important piece, to, so that part is about equity, right? The affordability and the access, but this is about a different part of a just transition. It's about the workers. And um, it, the workers in the gas system currently put in those HDPE pipes with a yellow line painted on them. And if they switch to putting in this system, they would have to put in HDPE pipes with a blue line on them. So they can do that. They're already certified for a lot of the work. And because of that, that is an incredible force to drive forward electrification, right? And in New York, just this year, there's been an extraordinary rapid um, process. Unfortunately, the electrification legislation did not go through partly from massive resistance from gas workers, utilities, et cetera, right? But the one thing that went through, sailing through, was a legislation to require every utility to begin to build thermal energy networks and to require you know, all the process to begin. And this is a video, I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but it is a video produced by the National Pipe Fitters. Um, it's a massive um, union organization, steam fitters, pipe fitters, plumbers, um, et cetera. Uh, and the head of them has made a statement and it's in here uh, basically saying, oh, climate change is terrible. It starts with like dramatic fires and floods. Climate change is utterly terrible. We need to do something. We are the solution. We're gonna build it. And uh, the way we're gonna build it is with thermal energy networks. Um, I don't actually know if this is gonna play after all of our tech. Yep, no, it didn't. So <laughs> I will share that. It's five minutes and you just have to watch it because it's so shocking and, and also really hopeful. Like if we can align that, we can move. Um, last benefit, I'm gonna come back to that efficiency thing because I think we've really gotta understand this one and keep thinking about it differently than we have been. Um, the graph up here, I'm sorry for all the graphs and nerdiness, but um, this is an installation that's been in the ground since 2008. It's a really fabulous installation in Colorado Mesa University. And um, at one point it grew rapidly and it let the electric uh, providers, Excel Energy know, um, and they grew from 800,000 square feet to 1,200,000 square feet. Um, at which point Excel Energy sent a note to, um, the, the, the university saying, you know, like, what is going on? What are you doing? Because they had kept their electric load pretty flat despite growing because all of their growth, they, they and uh, so they're about half um, network geothermal and adding more of their buildings, there are two more going online this year. Um, and that's the electric grid impact. If we can do that everywhere or even close, that's really good news. Um, I put this in because I just don't wanna leave the people part out and that's all of you too, is that because of all of the potential and benefits uh, and you know, you could get, for example, a lot of environmental advocates as well and as union workers to both testify in hearings, that's super powerful and helps things move faster. And that's been going on up in Massachusetts. Um, this is, I'm gonna go quickly past, um, but basically it's our attempt at creating a, a pathway of what needs to happen in order to move this technology forward. We're probably gonna keep changing it. Um, we're in the second part in Massachusetts. Um, New York is too. Um, a bunch of other states are, are moving forward, um, but we're trying to kind of provide the energy. So this is our legislative history on the topic in Massachusetts. So we've been going at it every session, session after session, and it's little wins, little wins. It's happening faster now in other states because they've seen it de-risked, right? Um, and in Massachusetts, we have six funded and approved network geothermal installations 
um, that are very slowly going in the ground. Um, and there is a drill rig drilling next Wednesday in Framingham, Mass, which is super exciting. Um, it is, again, a drill rig that drills a six inch wide hole 500 feet deep. It's exactly the same drill rig that is used for us to do water wells in our houses if you're not on municipal water. So it's really important to separate that from drill rig <laughs> with all kinds of other consequences. Um, so, and then on the right is a growing map of sites vying for the four national grid um, uh, projects that are being in the process of getting selected. Um, and two will go in next year and two the year after. Um, and then there's a, another one that the, uh, the DOER is doing that is on hold at the moment. Um, but it's from the Merrimack Valley Renewal Fund. So it's super exciting. And uh, it's really interesting to watch Eversource Gas uh, uh, shift their, you know, provide all of these um, messaging. Here's a map of the location. Um, one of my favorite stories coming out of this year is, and we're, we're uh, a, a friend of mine, John Chivaco, who's an amazing geo installer in New York. He came down to Eversource and spent two hours with their gas sales force. These are the people that go out and try to recruit new gas customers, knock on doors. And they, after two hours of geo training, they went out in Framingham and knocked on doors for a couple of days. And everyone in the company told me from all directions with great excitement that it was the best sales day of their lives. Hmm. They had the majority of the people whose doors they knocked on said yes. And they have more customers than they need and are looking for a second project. So, so that neighborhood had gas heating yeah. and they went and knocked and said, we're going to change your pipes and offer you water heating instead. So Eversource was the very first one to propose it. And so their uh, utility commission approval does not include removing the gas pipes. They actually had to give assurances that everything will remain. And if it doesn't work or people don't like it, they will turn the gas back on for each of the customers, you know, so that one is not doing the replacement we're envisioning. It's just getting us there. The national grid um, proposals took the next step and are providing all electric appliances with it and um, targeting the leak prone infrastructure. Um, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> uh, so the utility um, in this case, so. You know how everything in government basically is financed by the taxpayer? So everything in utilities or energy is basically financed by the rate payer, which is the customer. Uh, that's just, that is how it works. Um, but what it does is it kind of socializes the cost of energy over time. So um, this, these, the, the first um, five projects were approved by the, D the Department of Public Utility. You have a public utility commission. Um, and uh, they were allowed to spend the money. It was deemed as an appropriate investment for the customers to do these trials. And so spread out over all the customers, it's like a very minuscule amount of money um, and it'll be paid off over a long period of time. Um, and that's how it would work for the whole system. So all of those costs of how much would this cost, you know, how they were lower than gas and went down. It's actually because the infrastructure is more expensive than gas going in because you have the boreholes and the, and so you're paying a lot more upfront, but you're, the customer um, is basically paying more to pay off the infrastructure. It's almost like a mortgage, right? What your, your gas bill is kind of like that, um, but they don't have to pay any gas. And so the, the sum ends up shrinking in all the projections. We'll have to wait and see. Um, and as gas prices go up, that just gets better and better. <laughs> um, but uh, this is what's happening outside of Massachusetts. Um, so New York has 39 or more at this point, they keep moving, uh, feasibility studies. Um, there's a bunch of utilities, even more than is on here now. That law I mentioned, it's fabulous. It's not that long. Um, we should get to the Rhode Island <clears throat> law that you had filed last year. Um, 
feasibility studies um, are, have happened in Oregon with North, Northwest Natural Gas with Excel Energy in Minnesota. Um, Vermont Gas has actually formed its own branch called Geothermal, um, a new division in their, in their company, and are talking about whether they'll um, uh, become a nonprofit or something. It, that's Vermont. Um, none of the others are saying anything like that. <laughs> so, um, Philadelphia, um, PGW, there's a process, a future of gas process in there. Um, they've allocated funds for feasibility study. Um, and Washington, D.C. also has an approved installation. Um, <clears throat> we, we're also collecting data and researching from the Colorado Mesa project that I mentioned. And there's a bunch of other projects, but that one is by far the oldest and most interesting, built by a, a man, a, a, a gray edge group. I'm attempting to move forward, I think. I'm, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna try to wrap up. Uh, so what heat's role in this at this point, and it just keeps evolving, is we're gonna keep convening the different players, um, learning, and, and trying to solve the different problems that pop up, because there's gonna be problems in every direction the whole way through. Um, so we are running um, stakeholder engagement and collaboration meetings, we call them charrettes. Um, we are building an open library of resources and tools, and we're gonna try to build a kind of decision tree for a gas to geo transition for, to allow more people to get engaged. Um, and then we're also building a national database for the projects going in and have a research team that's wrapping around um, the, fir the first installations and pulling as much data off and doing independent third party research so that everyone understands it and can project forward what will happen. Yeah. Um, I'm Portland, I am a solar investor. I have no fountain for whatsoever. On the building in West Branch, yep. it's a combination solar and geothermal uh, system. Awesome. And uh, uh, I would say that if you have geothermal heat storage uh, unit under a hot parking lot, you're going to start already. Mm. The hotter water is thicker. Yep. If you have another one stored under an ice branch and you take excess electricity whenever you have it, Cool the area, we will start with cooler summer water. Yes, out there. Maybe you can take over an entire hill. We just don't see how. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And I, I love seeing, like, if you leave here and just look around and think about where all the thermal energy sources and settings are, see the world differently. London has done a thermal map, which is kind of fun. Um, I'm going to, uh, so this is actually the gas infrastructure. <laughs> Um, a map of it, uh, obviously with all the street names removed. Um, and it started going in in the 1800s and um, actually having interacted with it for a long time, it's kind of impressive it's lasted this long. Some of it, um, some of the pipe running right now in Massachusetts is from the time of Lincoln. Um, and I, if you think somebody put that first pipe in and envisioned this whole system, right? So it's not out of reach for us to entirely um, re-envision our energy system in a way that works for the future. It's time, it's overdue. This system is failing in multiple ways. So um, we can, you know, obviously do air source and ground source heat pumps individual in those industrial applications where appropriate, huge qualifications, but there are some places that are needed we can't meet. Um, and then, you know, pretty much the rest of it we could do with a thermal network mixing in a whole bunch of other sources and sinks. Rhode Island, with your totally unified electric and gas um, single utility company is a brilliant spot for this. You've got great bedrock. Um, and and uh, we've had a bunch of conversations with some of um, the folks in Rhode Island. There's a legislator, Rep Portland. I hope I'm saying it right. Perfect. Yeah, Terry, yes. Um, and she filed in the last session a bill called H7621, which was an adjustment of what we had filed in Massachusetts. She didn't, she did it kind of quietly. I think she would very much like, she's reached out and wants to build a coalition this time. Yeah. So that's all, all for you. And then, you you know, I she also sent me the, the um, 
draft staff recommendations for public comment for your future gas um, process. I'm sure other people know way more about that. I don't know much about Rhode Island, but it seems like a really critical moment where you can um, really move forward with some of this. Is it a current open comment period? Um, mm -hmm. Yep. I have the document here. It is open currently. Uh, closes Friday, October 7th. Right. So that's your comment Friday, period, guys. Talk to Terry and figure out what our <laughs> yep. messaging is on that. Yep. Um, and I'll just, the last slide. Um, we, everything that we do is under Creative Commons, which is open source. So take anything, just reference it. And then I just, I like to use this gas company president's statement when asked by a reporter if he was, um, you know, basically freaked out by uh, this, this idea that repl eventually replacing the gas network, he said, um, that's okay. One dis displacing the other is not a scary proposition. It's an exciting proposition. And that, to me, that gives me a lot of hope because if we're all battling each other, we're probably not gonna get there at the rate we're going now, right? Not a chance. But if we manage to find a way forward where we can move fast, let's do it. Also, all your engineers should be short women and large heads. Are you just close this? There, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, actually, okay. why don't you stay on so you're on camera? Oh, no. You can okay. close the presentation. Oh, I see. It's not letting you. It... Yeah, I was trying to close it. And make that picture. God, there. Um, so th there were a couple of questions um, in the chat on fundamentals, like, you know, how do how do heat pumps work for oh, yes. engineers? And, yep. you know, does this mean that all the buildings would have to have uh, ductwork instead of radiators? Those are awesome questions. Yeah. Um, so on the heat pumps one, um, my uh, the other co-executive director uh, tries to temper my geekiness by explaining things differently. She has a great way to explain this. A heat pump, first of all, all of you have a heat pump in your house, I promise. Your refrigerator is a heat pump, right? It's actually just moving um, heat out of the refrigerator into your actual into your house, um, <laughs> and then your your it, it keeps your popsicles cool, so it works. It's been there for as long as you can remember. So we know heat pumps; they work. They're a technology that's known. Using them for your whole house is a little more recent in terms of people's awareness. So the air source heat pump is using, again, temperature in the air to move heat. What Audrey says is it's like um, a, a when you make a spill on the outside and you use a sponge and you soak it up and then come over here and squeeze it out. The insides of the heat pump are a little like that. It's like you're soaking up, they're using a different a, a refrigerant to soak up temperature and then move it over and squeeze it out on the other side. And that, that um, allows us, so the more the temperature differences, the easier, the less work that pump has to do to move the heat. It's just a pump that moves heat. And so, so if you're taking a constant temperature from the ground, you're doing less work than if you're taking, um, you know, zero degree air on a, um, and you're needing to heat, right? or a hundred degree air and needing to cool, which takes a lot more work. Does that help? I, there's a hand, yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, so my name is Jim Stern. Um, so I, I do have a question uh, um, from my own experience. I guess I just put in um, a lot of convenience um, into, into some rental property mm -hmm. houses that I have. Yep. And I know that they have the right system, but they offer, you know, national grid, they offer all these free things for common heaters. And you say, well, this is, this is a short term solution for, uh, for what you're doing at the time, but I would love to be able to convert them, which I'll get into. Later on, I'm also a designer and innovator mm -hmm. looking to maybe find ways to um, to convert these things. Yep. 
So, um, but I wanted to get your thoughts on the set of common heaters, um, their, their gas, natural gas, heat, and hot water, yep. and how we can integrate those with bandwidth strap. Yep. Um, and there's a lot of them. So, one of the proposals that the future of heat um, process in Massachusetts. Um, surface. The question. Oh, uh, yes. Um, so the question was, you know, um, a, an individual had just gotten rebates from National Grid, well, now Rhode Island Energy, um, uh, to put in combi heaters, a um, natural gas fired boiler and hot water supply. And how could that be converted um, in the future or in some way not thrown away? Is that correct? Okay. So uh, uh, there was a proposal in Massachusetts, partly because we all have this um, logic thing where we, we the sunk cost fallacy, right? So we're, we, we put something in, so we don't want to waste it. And that's really good with food. Um, but uh, if we keep all these gas infrastructure, the gas boilers, especially when they're new and efficient, um, and we use them for just... So there's a proposal to use them just for the peak days and have everything else be air source heat pump, but that would be really efficient. And that was a big fight in Massachusetts um, because some people felt that was a really good kind of neutral approach. And uh, what I personally think is that is a win the battle, lose the war approach. <laughs> where you are, yes, you could more rapidly get AC heat pumps into people's houses and, and keep the gas infrastructure, but you're gonna to have to invest in that gas infrastructure and you're gonna be using it for so little, you won't be able to pay it off in the future. So you get out to 2050 and we won't be able to get there. Um, and it's again, that, that, that question of the way that utility infrastructure is paid off and carried by everyone. Mm -hmm. So, um, and any of these things, it doesn't mean that on a one-off case, it's not the right choice. These choices are really tough when you get to an individual building, right? It's just as a, as a whole, as a planning for a whole state and society, you don't, you've got to plan in the most um, effective way to actually get to your goal. And I think, there's a lot of discouragement in Massachusetts. We have this goal of a million houses electrified by 2030. And I think there's like, there, it was under 300 or one of the last numbers I saw, which might be a little out of date. And that's really discouraging. Um, and so they're saying, well, we can get to that target if, if we put um, AC that can do, that, that's an air source heat pump AC into our buildings, run it for the shoulder seasons, you know, and yes, Technically, you could do that. And then how do you get to the next one? So um, if there's just a neighborhood of, you know, four houses or eight houses or 10 houses, and they kind of want to go in on this together, is it going to be a lot more efficient for them to do a shared geothermal heat system? Or, you know, would, would it be simpler for each one to just do it on their own? So you're gonna save money on your drilling because the drill rig will charge less coming out once. Um, a huge portion of the cost is actually the moving of the drill rig. Um, and then you're gonna have some portion of savings for the shared use, but in an all residential neighborhood, a little less. And actually that slide I had of the balances that shows, I think you get, I can't remember the number, but um, so you are going to be better off sharing it. The challenge is that rights of way. So doing the legal process of putting pipes between you, if you're trying to do that in city streets, you're going to, that's hard. Um, and that's part of the reason that a bunch of geo utility startups were like, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to provide have just gotten us, uh, like it's been frustrating to try to get the rights of way. It's part of the advantage of having the gas utilities evolve their business model is that they are, um, they already have all the rights of way. They already have the customers, the billing, the workforce. Yeah. I have a question about the um, the gas awareness and relatedness and how 
that has gone, especially in terms of pilots in Massachusetts, I assume some of those communities are more willing participants, but there are, I imagine, still people in those communities that are resistant or don't know about it, or why should somebody come in and replace all icons with an analyst? Because in some places it is pretty much all of the appliances. Um, how do you how do you plan for that? So I think, first of all, we don't know how it's going to go. Um, but uh, in the case of these demonstration projects, um, they are recruiting basically from extremely willing locations. So the town of Framingham was very engaged. The town of Worcester was buying with the town of Framingham and Cambridge and, and Somerville. Worcester, we had 14 letters of support for that location from like all the way up to the federal senator. <laughs> um, and, and they were so disappointed when they didn't get it. And so as long as you have a core group of people that is really excited about it, and a lot of these towns are facing their own climate targets that are really challenging to meet. And so um, you don't have to get everybody on in the beginning. I think that what we had to adjust is like, okay, let's make sure we prove it out to people. And for a lot of people, just seeing and hearing is believing. Like, so have places where they can see it and then we'll think about that. But my opinion is the gas companies don't come and ask your permission to replace the full pipes, do they? My, my neighbor just had this, they, they put a little sign, they sometimes knock on your door, and I tell you, we're upgrading the infrastructure. Um, it's going to be two, two months of digging. Um, and that is historically accurate. Though. All of the ignitions were replaced when they went from cold gas to natural gas. Um, all of the ignitions were replaced in every single building. In New York, they did it in three years. And so we've done this before. It's a utility service. You can opt out. You can choose not to be on that service. So they could come to a street, say, hang little door knockers. Hey, we're upgrading to modern thermal infrastructure. And here's the set of things we need to get into your basement. <laughs> we, need, we need to do this. You know, which unit do you want or do you want to purchase your own? Um, and, uh, and then people can, there's gonna be some people who will be like, no, not over my dead body. And they can get a propane tank and they'll be the last adopters, right? When the prices start spiking, maybe they'll shift. But um, I think that there's a bulk in the middle of people who don't actually um, think about this or want to think about it. And if the utility is upgrading to modern infrastructure and all of their neighbors are doing it, it's just a process that happens to meet our climate goals. So I think it remains a choice, even if the utility itself doesn't offer a choice. No, uh, the heat rise, I think it is wrong. I got water in the way. If you draw too much water out of the well, after a certain time, it's going to go dry and you have to wait for the groundwater to replenish that water in the well. So that kind of happens with these heat. Right. Um, so I didn't want to put too many boring name slides, but there's also multiple types of geothermal boreholes. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and what you're talking about is an open um, well where you do pump water right. um, and you're actually accessing groundwater. We decided not to propose that at all. Though it is sometimes the most efficient proposal, it requires different permitting, it, it, there's just a bunch more stuff to it and it's less predictable. So, what I mean is, what I mean is that I was talking about the heat itself, not just the oh, the water. heat itself. I mean, I mean, there's, there's a limited rate of heat flow yes. through the soil, and it, at some point, you're going you're gonna to extract so much heat that the temperature of the surrounding soil is going to be pretty much the same as the, the water that you're. So that is exactly the challenge that is what geothermal borehole design is all about. So what the engineers do is they figure out the, the, the load profile of all, all the buildings and then 
the thermal conductivity. And actually next Wednesday, those boreholes are gonna get thermal conductivity tests to test how rapid the temperature moves. And then you basically design the system for a, a linear feet of borehole that can handle that without um, basically maxing out and causing the heat pumps to work so hard that your electric bill goes up. Um, it won't stop working, but it will be really inefficient. Yeah. There's another question about um, is there any risk of landslides or earthquakes when you're drilling into the bedrock? Yeah. So um, again, these are so in the in the drilling industry, um, I've had a few guys say, "Oh yeah, you're putting those those pin cushions in, <laughs> um, or you're poking holes. They're six inch holes um, at max. Um, the pipe is two inches and." Um, in almost every location, uh, that is not an issue. I'm gonna say that if you're on a cliff, you can't get a drill rig there anyway, so you're not gonna do that. Um, if you have a um, a land, a, 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 you know, a toxic waste site, um, that's another consideration. You don't wanna expose people to it by drilling into it. Um, but no, this, does, this technology has been around forever. It does not cause earthquakes. And, um, I've never heard of a landslide. It does make a mess and sound loud. But then when it's done, you can't tell it's there. So there's all these installs that it's just a green field or it's under the building. They're putting them into the pilings of buildings. Oh, you know what? If if the still, no, it doesn't. Um, I have pictures of like this. The, there was a building in Seoul, Korea that for a few months was the tallest building in the world. And under the base of it is this massive skyscraper, super fancy looking. Under the base of it are 1,100 boreholes that are providing 70% of its heating, just under the footprint of the building. Um, and then uh, there's this awesome Olympic stadium in China that has a titanium seawater heat pump under the dock. So you just see this little dock and this very stylish building, but under the dock, the heat pump's pulling temperature off of the sea and using it to heat. Why can't we do that? That's what I was about to ask. We can. We have seen. We have seen. <laughs> and raw. Um, uh, someone asked earlier about the HVAC in the house. I think that might be the messiest problem of all. Um, because as you probably have run into, every house is different. It's like a thumbprint. <laughs> um, and uh, if you have an old steam system, we can't connect to it with this system because it's not a 180 degree <clears throat> temperature rise. Um, so if you have hot water or forced hot air, you can basically, in many cases, plug and play. But I say that with a caveat because <laughs> there's all kinds of systems out there. But you're going to have to have the HVAC connection made. So in the best case scenario, you have um, a system like, like a force hot air, and you're basically gonna pull out the boiler, pop in a box like this, that's your heat pump, it's gonna connect to the supply, and then you turn it off. And, and, and the, it's really plug and play in that sense, but there's gonna be a lot of houses where there's gonna need to be adjustments um, to the internal stuff. And if you don't have ductwork, you can't have the cooling, right? Um, and increasingly we're needing cooling, so, um, it's an opportunity. Um, and one of the things we proposed in Massachusetts was to create a funding stream to provide that work, including electric panel upgrade and HVAC supplies for all low income um, uh, in the process of the utility financing. Uh, don't know if that worked. Yes. This is awesome. I, I think we've out of time. But, um... Let's thank our speaker again. Oh, I should mention one more thing to you. The head of your PUC is very well informed, your utility commission. He's very, very well informed and would like to see this happen. He's, I mean, I, I just, he was participating in a lot of our threats in Massachusetts. Um, he knows all about it. Uh, also, Rhode Island Energy, Ron Garotowski.
Um, Rhode Island Energy has met with us twice, is very interested in looking at, a, would be interested in potentially doing a potential study. That was um, So uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity at the moment in Rhode Island. So. Okay, thank you.